You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, former prep course ops superintendent and current special reconnaissance training guru, Trent Segmiller. All right, welcome back, everybody, uh, future teammates. Uh, you're with Ones Ready in the team room for the podcast. And just like always, it's the greatest podcast you've ever seen, watched, or listened to. Uh, so you're welcome. Uh, we also want to thank you, I guess, for watching and listening. We, we want to start off by saying you're welcome, though. That was a, that's a good one. So first of all, you're welcome for, for I mean, getting blessed. I want to just put out the value of the podcast. I think it's pretty amazing. And I wish that I would have had this before I joined. So uh, I think it would be dishonest of me to say that I'm not proud of what we're putting out. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we do want to thank everybody out there that's subscribing, uh, interacting with us on uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, everywhere else, uh, Twitter. I don't know if we do Twitter. Uh, whatever the kids are using these days, Reddit and all that other stuff. And uh, listening on all the, the Spotify and everything else. Uh, I, apparently Spotify is the next big thing. If you haven't heard the news, go check it out. Find a Google. See what happens. Also, I want to talk about some friends of ours. We have Alpha Brew Coffee Company. If you want to get caffeinated the natural way. We have Strike Force Energy, my personal favorite, if you want to get caffeinated in the, you know, my way. And then uh, we have Everly Stock. So if you want to go out there and ruck and use the best equipment uh, for hunting, rucking, whatever else, uh, go to Everly Stock, do yourself a favor. All those companies, throw in ones ready, get yourself a discount. We don't get anything for it. They're just awesome companies. We'd like to support them. So today, our guest, now that I'm done talking about myself and everything that I love, is Gavin Fisher. So Gavin is a pararescue man. Did I say that right? Pararescue man? Yeah, it's a PJ, pararescue para, jumper. Pararescue person. <laughs> per, um, person. And he's got a lot of experience operationally, uh, ANS, uh, all that other stuff. So like always, we're going to ask Gavin, what's your background? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, get this thing rolling. Cool. So thanks for uh, having me on the podcast. Uh, it's nice that you guys are putting out all this information all the time. Like you said, I wish I would have had this before I joined. So see, try, try to do my best to, <laughs> did you to, just, represent, to represent well. Did you just say I told you so off of something Gavin said? <laughs> see, told you so. Gavin agrees with me. If the guest agrees yeah. with me, then I can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so my background is I joined in February 2010 as a straight PJ student went through the pipeline and the average two and a half years, uh, my first and really only operational duty station was Vegas, the 58th rescue squadron. But I was there for like almost seven years. So, and then within that time frame, I knocked out on average, a deployment every year. Some of them were back to back deployments. Like I would go from, uh, like Kuwait or Iraq, right into Africa. So kind of, you know, a little space here and there. But my first deployment was when we were still doing the uh, actual Kazavak missions, the true Pedro stuff, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and that really kind of, I got a lot of job satisfaction out of that because there was just blood and guts, danger, everything. And then that kind of took me through some of these more vanilla deployments, like to Kuwait, uh, and kind of kept going along on the state side when i wasn't deployed uh i was going to help out stts and helping to take some guys through the air ops phase there i got to see like a lot of units even all the way up to alaska guard reserve other operational units so i've really been quite blessed as far as my experience goes uh but i do you know even though i was just technically at vegas for six and a half years i got to kind of see everything and then uh, you know, s some people know, but I got blown up and then I was talking to, uh, the chief in Vegas and he's like, well, Hey, like you've been here forever and you're going to have to go to San Antonio to get healed up anyway. And Indoc is there. You may get in on Indoc and then you have ANS that no one really knows what it is. Uh, but go there. And so I was like, cool. So my uh, girlfriend and I moved to Texas. I was in ANS for, uh, from the first class all the way to the one just before this last one. So that was about another year, year and a half. And then from there, I joined the 308th Rescue Squadron at Patrick Air Force Base, which is uh, Cocoa Beach, is how people refer to it a lot, the guys at Cocoa Beach. So and I've been here, and that's truncated version of my background. Nice. Well, I think what... What we want you to go into detail a little bit about is that initial, you know, going from civilian 
uh, how you heard about Pararescue, uh, your experiences in listing and, and through WinDoc, and maybe some of your what, some of the tools you use to make it through, and maybe uh, some of the things that have changed or, or any advice that you'd give guys uh, and some of the things that you used. Okay, so uh, going to join the military. The reason why I chose the Air Force, first and foremost, is I was talking to my own buddies, my parents, friends, complete strangers with veterans hats on, and they all started saying the same thing. And I'm talking about World War II veterans to Vietnam Green Berets to, you know, fresh after uh, September 11th Navy SEALs. And they're like, what I did in the military, I wouldn't change for the world. But if I could do it again, I would try doing that in the Air Force because you're not operating 24 seven, 365. Like what do you come home to? And they always said that, you know, the air force has the best food, the best bases, the cutest guys and girls, you know, like whatever. <laughs> I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be inclusive. Hey, that is, said, no, that is true. Like just look at our focus baby. group. We've got a, a lot of good looking guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. Of course. It's a pretty good <laughs> representation. Uh, right here. But they're like, they're like, do it in the air force, dude, do, do what, you think is right in the air force because you come home to the air force to have the best deployments, deployment schedules and blah, 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 blah. So I went in my parents, my dad's a cop. My mom was a firefighter and they're like, well, go do something cool. Like you're, you're not going to, the way I am, you're not going to enjoy your life. If you're just a cook or a financier, not to speak ill of those, but it wouldn't have held my attention. So I went into the recruiter and I'm like, what's the coolest most challenging thing in the air force. And he's like, Oh, you'll never make it. And I was like, I'll do that. And I didn't know what it was. <laughs> you, you had me, at, you had me at condescending to me. <laughs> I'm going to do this now. To did you, you say I can't do yeah, something? No, you talk to me like that. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you keep a tally pitch. of how many people have been told that they're never going to make it when they go it's to recruiter. Everybody, it's be I like don't even. Yeah, fifteen. Yeah. I, we need to write like a an FAQ on what to say to people when they tell you inevitably <laughs> that you're not going to make it. It's so common. Like I don't understand. I wonder are the yeah. people that were told that versus the people that weren't told that. Like who made it? I feel like all of us were told that, so we had to make it. Because There's that. one thing that can be certain is the person telling you that was probably told that, and they were right. Like that's the only that's the only thing that I can possibly think of is that they're hurt about something else. It's terrible. Well, as an instructor, uh, you know, I know uh, some of you guys know this. You're just like you're never gonna make it. You, you know, like just quit now. And the person who makes it at the end, you're like, you told me I wasn't gonna make it. I'm like, I don't even remember who you are. Even know your what's your roster number? I don't even know your name. Yeah. Do you have a name? Yeah, you're you're welcome yeah. for the motivation. Yeah, you look so much different with not having MRSA all over your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ANS is rough. So, but uh, anyway, uh, going through Indoc, which is of course way harder. Uh, just a little shit talking. Of course. Uh, <laughs> hey, did you, before we, you before you go on, were you, were you in that area where you had a developer? Like, have you worked? Did you work with somebody before you got nope, in, or was it all nope, you? Nope. Nope. Uh, the the McNeely brothers. They had just graduated PJU and they were doing RAS. So I was pretty lucky, but they really just kind of like smoked the shit out of me and tried to get me to quit. And I didn't. Uh, and then that's, that's all the development I had. We had nothing special and basic besides all being in the super flight. Uh, but there's no special diet, no special training. Uh, Cervantes came and talked to us like two weeks before we graduated basic and basically told us that we weren't going to make it. But Paris, he's like super cool and kind of, you know, rebalances, but there was nothing like it is now. And then after you graduated basic, you had the weekend and then you went straight into Indoc, just nine week warrior camp. Um, but so a lot of these guys I hear saying like, Oh, I never had quit in my mind. Like, and I think it's a lie. Like I grew up like very comfortable middle class. Like if I didn't make it through Indoc, like I had options. And so quitting crossed my mind, like, all the time. Like we'd be on a run and I was like, I want to quit. I was thinking about, yeah. Oh yeah. I know you guys have had this feeling, but have you ever been on just the longest run of your life and you just wish through no fault of your own that your leg would break and you'd just be like, listen, I didn't do anything. It was just a thing that the doctors missed. It was a stress fracture that never healed right. And it just broke mid run. I'm going to go take it to the hospital. Yeah, like looking for those validating injuries. So you're going to quit, but you know, you weren't going to make it anyway. Like practicing your sad face for when yeah, it happens. Really, like, I can't oh, believe yeah, so my sad. tip fib snapped in half. I didn't see yeah. that rock. Oh no. I would just, yeah, but all the time, like holding my breath. I'm like, this sucks. I should just pop and quit. But I would, you know, this run, this is heinous. Like, I don't like it. But I would, I would think about 
quitting for so long that by time <laughs> I even probably even got close, the event was already over. And I was like, oh, huh, maybe I'll quit on the next one. You know, like, <laughs> you distracted <laughs> yourself by making yeah. you making up quitting yeah. in your head. And the, yeah, the only thing that they prepped me for the McNeely brothers were like, look, you're going to make it like in doc, even though they'll, they'll test you and everything. Like you will get stronger over the nine and a half weeks that it, it takes. Like you just have to show up every morning and not quit. So I wonder if I, that's you know, why that, so many people quit after the end of an event. You, you ever notice that where that, you know, you're, you're just in the pain cave and they just, they ask for a quitter, never get it. And then at the end of the pool session, dude gets up and grabs the bullhorn and quits. Yeah. We had a guy, yeah, no true. kidding, like getting ready to carry the log over after my whole night. I was a young airman and he's like, I'm ready to quit. I was like, what are you doing? We're done. We're going home to get a shower and go to bed, dude. Like they're not screwing with us anymore. Like we're, we're done. Like this whole mm-hmm. week thing, it's over. Like I'm, t- I'm not screwing with you. Like we're done. He's like, nope. So his mind made up. He's like, I'm out of here, dog. I actually have a theory about all this stuff and it has to do with as, as VAB scores because I used to do the student affairs stuff whenever I was an instructor or before I became the instructor supervisor. But when I look at the people that would quit, anyone that was over 95 would quit on the, in the morning because they'd be overthinking it and they'd be like just contemplating what was going on and they couldn't figure out and they couldn't find a pattern. Those people that were like in the lower end, they'd quit during the pool session because they're impulsive. So I don't know where you, I don't want you to share this unless you're comfortable with sharing your ASVAB score. But I don't even, I don't even remember what it is. But I passed. <laughs> I think I somewhere in the middle because I didn't quit at all. I don't so, remember right, what exactly. Yeah. All right. So you're, those people in the middle are the ones that make it because you can't be yeah, like exactly. too, too smart, but you can't be, you know, <laughs> on like the lower end. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're good. Exactly. Wait. If I get that <laughs> in my online courses, that's a pass, homie. Yeah. I would, I would, and I didn't think about quitting like every event, you know, they're all like not that hard at times, but what, what I did tell myself and what I I do try to tell students, this is I was like, look, no matter what happens, this day will end. This course will end. No matter what happens, it will end. However, when you go back to the dorms, whether it's at the end of the day or at the end of the course, you're going to go back as a quitter or as a graduate. And a graduate of that day, a graduate of the course, like it doesn't matter, but no matter what happens, you're still in AETC. People lose their perspective all the time. Like that's why when the, the cadre tell you have, the cadre could tell you have 30 minutes to put on your shoes and tie them and it'd go by like this, but you tell someone to hold their breath for one minute and it, it's an eternity. So just not losing perspective of, of time and how it will end and how you want to end that day, no matter what happens, will always be under your control. Yeah. And that's- so I went from thinking about like quitting on every event and I kind of, cause you know, waking up at 3am to go get your shit pushed in is like, like the most exciting <laughs> I stuff think, at 3 I think I had the winter schedule. We yeah. did not, that was not the first event of the day usually. I don't yeah. remember having that. I don't remember. You yeah, might want to go talk to somebody about that. Different schedule. You guys, yeah. you guys didn't have that cadre everyone called Uncle Tony? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Capo's not gonna like that. Fantastic! Now we've done it. <laughs> great, great that guys. Yeah. Well, so you uh, took that all the way through, you know, your in doc experience and, and getting through that and, and not being a quit. Obviously, you were a graduate during those days, thanks to your middle, you know, middle of the road ASAP scores and uh, inability to get wrapped up in an event. But take us through the pipeline, man. What was your what was your favorite school? So you got out of in doc, and then I'm assuming you just hit like the normal progression. You went straight to dive, and then in some order. Airborne dive, seer free fall. Dive school was the first time that I felt like because you go through indoc and immediately after you graduate indoc, the indoc story start uh, just sure. like any other type two fun where it sucks when you're going through it, but it's your favorite memory and it's the one you talk about forever. But I still feel like even now these days, because after A and S, you go through pre dive and then to dive school, which you're either going through the Air Force one, the Army one, whatever. But I feel like dive school may have been one of the most fun schools, but I didn't really feel like I was in the pipeline yet because dive school still had a high enough attrition rate or you'd get set back or whatever. Uh, And I had so much fun in dive school in Panama City Beach. But after I got through dive school and I got to Albuquerque, like the capital of the PJ Condom, like that's where I felt like I, I was in it now. And that's where I really started turning. And I like I that's where I probably had the most buy in. 
is when I got through Indoc. I got through dive school and I arrived to Albuquerque like in the, in the middle of the night and there was snow on the ground. I'm like, nice. Like this is where I'm at for the next like, you know, two years. Just so was that, this was that your moment or was there a time in training where you're like, holy crap, I might be, I might be doing this PJ thing for real. Like this might actually be a possibility. That, that, that was after, uh, PJU. Like I, so I made it through all the hard schools on the first try, but like I got set back in airborne. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, wait, why did you get set back in airborne? Did you have your uh, feet and knees apart or something? You know how many people, you know how many people you want to talk about ASVAB scores of people falling out of military aircraft on a static line? Homie, I I got some uncomfortable numbers to share with you, my friend. (laughs) Yeah. Do you guys know Jake Racico? Yeah. Yeah, so Jake Bronco Racico, not to name full names and social security numbers, uh, but uh, we were playing rock, paper, scissors in the harness shed. And this is like our second day of jumping. So I already had three jumps in the bag. <laughs> and we're playing rock, paper, scissors. And then the, the first sergeant was like, I airborne. And so what happens? The whole 800 people in the hangar are like, oh, look. And he's like, you air force with like just the most like disturbing tone and so only like eight of us are looking are you always and he goes accent. and he's like from the and he's on the far end like the second story up on the little black hat ledge and he's like you and so jake racico and i both stand up and he says that as i was doing the airborne shuffle like a hundred yards to him that i rolled my eyes at him and i was well like, i mean did you well, I mean, probably after he said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I did not at the time he was accusing me for. Uh, so they, they, the other, they told me afterwards because I graduated after, immediately after my second jump, I didn't go through the airborne graduation. The Black Hats were just like, you can leave if you want. So I called the, uh, the traveling lady. I'm like, hey, can I go back to Albuquerque now? And she's like, yeah, sure. So I just left in the middle of the night and the Black Hats were like, yeah, that was kind of, a little extreme on his part, <laughs> but they only sent me back a weekend. So I didn't have to go back through the whole thing. So you, you just bounced. You're just like, I'm yeah. out of here. Okay. Yeah. I think my flight out was like at 2 a.m. I think that's and actually was, a better story was, than the, Hey, I, I got recycled on airboard. I think that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They gave, they gave me blood wings and stuff. Was, that's, that's, that gave me some buy-in, you know, um, <laughs> but I'll, uh, Paramedic, Did you go to the cool. airborne that we all went to? <laughs> Man, <laughs> this has never happened before, but do we find out that you're actually a poser on the podcast as we're talking about it? Like, did you also work for the CIA fresh out of your indoctrination team? Is there parachute like bags of sand or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never actually became a PJ. I'm just a deep state operative. That's fine. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the world we're living in. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. What was your, uh, when you were in Albuquerque, right? So you're, you're kind of feeling feeling that vibe and getting in your flow as it were down in Albuquerque. What was, uh, what was the biggest struggle in Albuquerque? Was it paramedic for you or was it a different, was it, you know, the apprentice course? What was it? The biggest struggle was the apprentice course for me, because by the time you get there and, you know, I know you guys know this, but for the, the listeners, like the PJU and you get your bray, like you're, you're like done after that. It's not like the controller, like SR pipeline, where it's just like these mountain ridges of like, you're an operator, you're not an operator, you're an operator, you're not an operator. Like it's just the, the PJ pipeline, you're in PJ, and you're like, if I could just get this knocked out, I am in it. I have done it. I'm done. I get to go to a team like, and it's awesome. But I got set back. What was it? No, I, so I actually was a part of three PJU teams. Uh, I got set back on dirt med uh, on my first team. Uh, and then on my second team, I made it all the way to water ops. And at the, this is like one of those things, how standards change, but it's just the luck of the draw. But when I was doing water ops, uh, I exited and I had the, the heads tank on my right leg, which at the time was like this huge thing, even though now none of us think twice about it. Uh, and I did like a 90 degree turn and then I like turned back. So I'd like do it again, but then I did another, 180 turn and yep. i like fail get out well, yeah then, get yeah, your stuff like, go to station one no wonder <laughs> yeah but thankfully the the cadre there uh you know we're like hey like he's a good guy he's blah 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 we'll give him another shot because at the time the three pj like you only got the one setback and then you were out so i was once again very lucky uh, and then on my uh my third pju team and i got to join 
the last one that had already gone through like dirt med and land nav again. So it wasn't like a full three teams. I just got set back to the, the junior team. Um, and that's when I finally graduated. And you talk about like a moment of pride, like putting on your bray and you're done. And, uh, we had like all the awesome cadre, uh, there and the, the, I don't want to spoil it, but you know, you're going through FTX and they normally come up with some cool way. The FTX is your final field training exercise and they, they come up with some cool way to like present you your berets. And so for us, they're like, all right, last minute mission. Uh, like you guys just have to deliver this, uh, this resupply to this team on top of the mountain. So we spent like five hours carrying this heavy ass box up this stupid fucking mountain. <laughs> up this stupid <laughs> mountain in a stupid like, cold. Cause it's always a winter class. Yeah. And they're like, everyone is just at each other's throats. And then we get up there and all the cods are up there and like, Oh, let me guess now back down the mountain, you know? Like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so they're like, open the box and we open the box and there's like a bunch of braids in there. And we're like, what's in the box? Oh my God. Like, what? like, like <laughs> we didn't even realize it at first. Then we all like started, you know, little, little tears of joy, maybe hit here and there. But I, I, I didn't cry. I just had something to pull my eyes. Uh, <laughs> That, that's that's when i finally it gets dusty out there on those ranges range 60 gets really dusty homie <laughs> yeah. i know the mountain that, you're talking about it gets dusty up there yeah that that's that's when i was like man I've, i did it it's awesome and then like i said my first deployment i was right in the fight right away and so i had a lot of career field validation that some of the new guys aren't necessarily getting uh these days right now but uh whether you're about to come in or you just got your beret or you've been in a couple of years and you're starting to like lose hope like the the fight will happen like <laughs> you're you're in special operations you're the you're the first people to get in the fight normally in any kind of war louder quiet and like it will happen just when you're you know your god decides it or you decide it or your boss decides it. like if it's if it's your time like it's gonna happen and bringing it on the real you know, like a fob plight out there in Albuquerque, like Jason plight died on his first deployment, didn't he? And then you have people like uh, chief McCaskill who went through 20 years of a military career and crushed it. And then, uh, you know, then un unfortunately was killed on the end of this deployment. So don't, don't fall prey to this immediate gratification culture that we've all started to be living in, like put in the hard work. And I'm not saying stick with something you don't agree with, but you're never going to get any mission. If you get out there, you're never going to get any mission if you quit, you know? So. No, that's, that's good. And it kind of, it's a good transition for us because I wanted, I wanted to ask you since we've been focusing on the pipeline and PJU, once you got to your first duty station, like what was that like? You already said that you were on back-to-back -back deployments and deploying on an average of every year. So what were some of those deployments like for you? Uh, they, they were all awesome. My, my first deployment, you're doing, you know, a couple missions every day. Uh, sometimes you would land and not even have time to call your wife or your girlfriend or your family because you're trying to shove food in your mouth, restock the, the, med, uh, well, yeah, Aaron, you were there. <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah, worst deployment of all time. His, uh, the team leader out yeah. there was, a, I hear, a real piece of work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, like, like it, it, it was just, you were in it. And even if you weren't doing missions that day, the camaraderie between everyone, like, it was everything I bargained for. And then even on these, you know, stupid deployments, like, to Kuwait, uh, like, there was 0.0, .0 chance of us getting a mission in Kuwait. And so we just all <laughs> focused on working out, becoming better in our skills uh, and everything like that. And I, I have my favorite deployments, my least favorite deployments, but I have pulled something out of every de deployment that has made me better. And you deploy with the same guys over and over again, and you get closer. Uh, but... I don't know. I was kind of rambling. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, uh, it's good. But I mean, but like, yeah. so those deployments, fantastic learning experience. What were the different mission sets that you accomplished? Like okay. the different roles that you had on each of those deployments? So on my first two deployments, I was a team member. So I was just worried about, uh, I, and I was with the PJ team. So I was just worried about medicine and being in shape and doing what I'm told. On my 
middle two deployments, I was an element leader and I was also getting my like instructor upgrade. And I started bringing it up the younger PJs under me now uh, to get better as well as developing my leadership skills. Uh, that was what, that was like Kuwait and Africa where I was an element leader. And Africa was awesome because you'd get to go work with the tier one guys and, you know, other places. Uh, and then you'd come back to, uh, the horn where we're all at and you get to continue being like a PJ element leader and you doing like these long ship pickups, uh, and still working on medicine. And then my last two deployments were as a team leader. Uh, and I think being a team leader is like the most awesome thing, uh, because it's not like in the army or Navy where if you're a team leader or a troop chief, you have like all these people underneath you and you're like in an admin role, but as a PJ team leader, there's, like six guys under you on a team and you just, you know, you come up with your own training schedule and your missions get launched and you make the calls of the pilots and you're, you're still so involved at this upper echelon leadership level. Um, and then on my last deployment, I started off as like the, the, we call it the TRS team leader, basically the guys that are just going to farmed out. Uh, but I basically went there, made sure all the young PJs were squared away with gear questions. Cause over the course of all these other deployments, I got to work with the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, the French, the Polish, everyone like that. And I would just get, you know, farmed out here and there. Uh, so I pushed all my guys out to the ODA teams. And then I took the last team uh, with one of my youngest guys and uh, gave him the ominous dominus after I had him set up all the med rucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then I sent him uh, to another team. And that's, uh, that's when I stopped being a team leader on this last deployment. And I was just a PJ on an ODA team, no team member, team leader. I was just, my job was there to be the technical rescue specialist, an enabler, a medic. Like, I don't, I don't care. You can call me whatever name you want. Like I know how to. <laughs> the, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just, well, we talk about this and I've talked about this with some other guys. Does that ever surprise you how fast in our community guys go from the new guy to like the salty older guy getting the younger guys ready because <laughs> uh, that's all i could think about during your stories oh yeah yeah it's it's insane uh, it we call them the big three it's moody tucson and vegas the active duty units but that's a puppy mill like you get you get the most <laughs> new guys out of any of the units you bring them up hopefully get a deployment or two squeezed out of them and then uh base but a lot of times within a year or two, you're either starting your element leader upgrade or you are an element leader, depending on how squared away you are. But yeah, you get, you get salty real quick. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think that the pipeline that you went through with PJU and everything, do you think that that prepared you for the deployment since you kind of went immediately after graduating? I, I think mine did because my pipeline, and the, the flavor of Dan Kazavak, Pedro missions. That's what all the scenarios were based around. That's what the stories of the cadre were telling were all a part of. And then my first deployment was right there. So for me, it was a perfect puzzle piece fit. Uh, I think these days you have uh, a lot more experience, thankfully, at the, at the schoolhouses. Uh, but the, the combat kind of ebbs and flows. And I think during this past couple years, the combat has kind of like gone down a little bit but uh that's why i talked about like the pipeline is still preparing people accurately but when you get out to the team you don't get a chance to capitalize on it right away yeah Does that makes sense yeah i i get what you're coming from i yeah so i know for me for my first deployment it was an enormous learning curve i mean that I couldn't believe how much I thought I knew and then hmm. where I went to as I as I'm going through a deployment. So do you feel that I'm gonna put you on the spot here, do you feel mm -hmm. that the pipeline prepared you better or that the unit prepared you better? What did you learn where what location did you learn more at? Oh, the unit. Uh you could, you know, go to the best college in the world, but you're going to learn and retain most of what you know from your first job after that point. Uh, the, I always say how there's not a difference between ST and rescue and I'll fight that with the most passionate of them. However, as, a, how as dare an you? early, is the early young PJ to a rescue unit? <laughs> yeah. When you go to a rescue unit is your first, uh, 
station, you learn that like I can rely on my other fellow new guys to kind of help me through this. But when you go to an ST for your first unit, they're like, not only are you a piece of shit, but also <laughs> you're responsible for everyone and you need to learn how to do this. And you also need to learn how to give yourself a ticket to fly out there. Like, like, <laughs> like in, in an ST growing up, like I don't think anywhere in PJU do, do they prepare you full time in PJU. You're a member of a team mm-hmm. is a new guy at a rescue unit. You're going through green team or whatever is a member of a team. Then you're a team member and you have all these people to bounce questions on. But when you go to an ST unit, I think that's one of the hardest ones to start off at for a new guy is because that's where you have the ultimate responsibility on you and no one's going to help you besides maybe the controller who's already even saltier because of his difficult pipeline. (laughs) (laughs) There's a whole lot of saltiness going on here. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. When you ever get thrown into that, that mix and you just get out of PJU, like you said, one of, that was one of my first deployments is you're like up there with the Rangers and you're out there with everyone. They already doubt you because you're an air force dude. And they're like, what does this guy got? And then you got to prove yourself and, make sure you have all the right equipment and checklists. So it definitely is difficult, but I want to lead that into our next question. So you're doing all this stuff. It was awesome. You got all your, uh, everything you wanted out of becoming a PJ in Vegas and a little known fact. Also, we're in the same unit, but like we talked about in previous podcasts, we never even got to really see each other. Most of the time yeah. I'd see you in the bar in the uh, team room bar yeah. team room. um and we'd chat about when you guys were you know down range or whatever and then you guys would take off again or we'd take off but uh once that ended you had to transition to something um just like me i went to the schoolhouse uh down at lackland to uh work with, on indoc unfortunately that was going away when you were joining up so what made you kind of want to go down to lackland and work at ans uh so i really enjoy sharing my stories. And I think that it's something that comes natural to me. And it also helps me cope in, in a way, uh, you know, by telling my tales. And I, I benefited a lot from hearing people like Aaron that, you know, not only talked about all their triumphs, but also all of their like screw ups. And like, the not a lot of people are saying that these days, because even on social media, like operators are flawless, you know, perfect <laughs> practitioners of Patient, I think of another P word I couldn't, uh, but you know, like <laughs> you, people mess you up really all tried, the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was like, people mess up all the time, especially the special operators and especially the new PJ supporting an ODA team for the first time. And you ha- I understand how you have to taper that so that you know they still have confidence in you. But if you go in there 100% arrogant, you're going to get someone killed, you know, either yourself or someone else. So I like telling all of my stories, even if they're embarrassing or not. Uh, and when I was telling this to man, if you want to, you know, coach, teach, train, mentor, you can either go to Albuquerque or you go to Lackland. And I knew, and you know, some of you guys know about my past that I won't bring up, but I was done with Albuquerque. I maxed that town out. Uh, and I was like, I've never been to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me, let me, let me get out my hat. And we'll go down there. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, and so, and th- that's why I went down there and, uh, ANS, there is, like there's pretty much no, not, and I sound, but there's pretty much no more meaningful interaction between the cadre and the students at ANS. Like when I was going through NDOC, the instructors would be like, put you through this heinous thing and then tell you why they did it. But in the new ANS model, everything's so regimented, so structured for a good reason, but it also like sacrifices Like we can't tell the students why we just made them do this because it's part of the game, but also because we just don't have time. And so I wasn't getting that for, I was just basically smoking these people, telling them what garbage they were. (laughs) They're not selecting at the end of this course. And these guys don't even know why. And I never got a chance to tell them like, Hey, you're a great guy, but this, this is X, Y, Z. And they, they all get debriefed at the end if you make it. Uh, And I'm by no means not trying to talk total shit about ANS, but I wasn't getting that fulfillment. Like, you know, you did in uh, Albuquerque or you did it. Uh, uh, in Doc. In Doc. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. That was one of my favorite things was being able to mentor and, so and, you know, talk to the guys and at the end of the day, be like, Hey, 
I smoke the sh- the crap out of you right now today, and this is why. This is what you did. This is what you did, and we. I went through a whole list throughout the day, especially being the proctor and like being able to see the team and stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't know exactly the backstory of ANS and everything that goes on uh, beyond that, but um, I think the mentorship is important, which is why we're doing this whole podcast thing, so you guys can reach out to us and talk to us about our experiences. And you guys realize, because I'm sure Gavin, you felt like, man, I'm just a monster, and all the students think that I'm just a monster. And I'm just freaking smoking them for no reason. And I can't explain that it's for a good reason. Like I want them yeah. to know that I care about them because all the instructors do care about the guys that end up making it in the end because we want those guys to be better than we ever were we want the right guys to be with our teammates that are going to be deploying downrange and everything like that so we care about the end result and it's it is hard to just go there torture people and then go home without saying hey uh this is why i did it yeah like pj's controllers sr like it's the most chill awesome group of people ever and any, it like, you know, like, uh, I, I didn't know peaches before this at all, but you know, Aaron introduced us and just talking with him and just like immediately connection, you know? Uh, and I feel like that was in part fostered in the pipeline through interaction with, with cadre and other team members, but there, there's no time for that anymore. And like, I wanted to be able to, to get back in. I tried transferring to Texas, like pre-dive or, a. <clears throat> you know, stuff like that. It just wasn't panning out. I tried coming down here to Tampa in the, uh, I forgot what the position is called. It's like some PR planning position here at the SOCOM headquarters. Uh, that wasn't available at the time. And then I tried going the SOAR route, the special operations recruiter, where you get to, you know, keep your beret and all your pays and really just, that would be awesome for me because I love telling people why they need to do this and getting them to come in and being successful. And then uh, that didn't work. And part of it, you know, was maybe command level stuff. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'm getting out. And they're like, why are you getting out? <laughs> I was like, well, cause I'm not <laughs> like, I'm not just going to like sit here and hate my life. Uh, not that I, that I hated it. Uh, but I wanted to find more meaning. And then I knew that you could palace chase and palace front getting into the, the reserve, you know, part of this. And so I started chasing that down, called out to, to Coco beach. And do you guys want to get, yeah, actually that's, that is the next question. To, uh, you know, how, in, how intense was that application process? Did they look at your hair, you know, and did they look at it in all phases to make sure that you're good enough to be a uh, PJ still? I got to yeah, imagine well, you got to be on some sort of a waiver right now. Like there's no uh, way that you're. Yeah. Yeah. So it all moved from up here to down here. So, oh man, you got, you got power alleys now, bro. You look like, uh, you look like what's his name? Woody Harrelson ate Woody Harrelson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I sent him older photos of when I was clean shaven with a full head of hair and they're like these guys and then a <laughs> mongrel pup showed up uh, it was too late but uh yeah the the application process the insert you also if you're active duty the you have to go to an in-service recruiter and the in-service recruiter is a reservist or a guardsman on full-time orders so they can work all the time to help you out and then you can either basically palace chase or palace front a palace front is where you sign up for the guard or reserve. And then when you're at, you just, you're the next day you're in the guard or reserve. And so a palace chase is where up to a year out. So if I had a, a year left on my active duty service contract, I could call a unit in the guard or reserve and they'd be like, I want to give you my last year of active duty service. And there's for every month, for every X amount of months they accept, you owe them like another year of service. So there's a trade off just like with anything. Uh, and so I palace chased because I was trying to get out of Texas quicker uh, than a palace front. So I started really honing in on the units. All the PJ Guard Reserve units are awesome. Um, <clears throat> but there was really only one that I wanted to go to. Uh, so my my girlfriend identifies Florida like as home. I love Florida. Who doesn't love Florida? Uh, and so there's <laughs> a lot know, of florida man going. around here yeah, yeah. <clears throat> listen <laughs> we're not talking we're not talking panhandle boys we're talking atlantic side down that, that india atlantic like we're talking florida's got levels all right yeah. we're talking in between miami and the panhandle and your boys around here <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and so uh, like alaska that's awesome as far as pj units that remain gainfully employed stateside as well there's so many but i 
narrowed it down to either Alaska, because those guys are operating all the time. Uh, and then Cocoa Beach with the NASA, you know, missions and stuff down here. And so I had mentally, I had already ran down the rabbit hole completely as far as like of pair rescue. Not that I'm done with that, but I'm like, there's so much that goes to this beret. There are other aspects of it. Like I want civilian rescues. I want Rams jumps. I want space shuttle stuff and Cocoa Beach, uh, not only for the location, obviously, but also for just the, the, I think they have like the broadest mission set of any of the, of the PJ units. And I, and I know it's arguable and I'm not trying to sound, uh, argumentative about it, but that's where my mindset was. I was like, if I want to explore every corner of this beret, like I need, and then a bunch of my, you know, of course, a bunch of my buddies were down, down here, like these down here as well and stuff like that. And so like all the boys are there and it's in the fun and the sand and the sun. You're like, are you kidding me? Like, of course they're going down there. So, uh, the first, the first step for me is talking to my supervisor. And then I, uh, he's like, all right, yep. I'll, we accept this. The commander had approved it. My uh, new commander had come in at that point. And so he approved it and he's like, all right, we'll call down there and get yourself brought on because for any of the units, you a bro system, but you still need their backing to make it happen in the way that it should. So I called uh, chief Z who just retired, did an on the phone interview with him. He's like, well, he sounded awesome. And then he made a round of calls uh, asking about me, you know, like I know he called a, uh, I know he called me you know, asked him, <laughs> and he was like, like, do you know Gavin Fish? And he's like, do I know? Gavin yeah. Fish? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, don't hire him. <laughs> how, much, how much time you got, buddy? Yeah. Uh, so then they approve you, even though it's not on paper or anything like, yeah, we want you down here. We'll help you on our end with the paperwork. And this is for any of the guard or reserve units. You, you just don't apply to go there. Uh, they want to know who you are because you're going to be working there potentially for a very long time time. It's not like active duty where even if you're liked or loved, you move around every couple of years. Uh, they really invest in everyone from the operators to the support. And so they really want to make sure they're hiring the right person. But, but I do want to make a point. And that point is, is the calls still happen on active duty. It's a very small community and people know you. Uh, so if you think you're walking into a situation with a clean sheet of paper, you're probably incorrect. Uh, the calls have <laughs> so, been made. Yeah. Yeah, when, yeah, you you never go into a unit in active guard or reserve being a complete stranger, uh, for better or for worse. Either your buddies know you or the bosses know you or your reputation for good or bad is known. But I think there's just more of a premium on it in the guard and reserve when you're palace chasing or palace fronting. Um, and so I went through that, the, the paperwork, bad. And for me, I had all these waivers that I needed to get, not only for a cool guy shaving waiver, of course, but then uh, they, the paperwork takes like two weeks to get approved, disapproved, or just sent back to you. So every time I had to fix a problem, I would have to wait two weeks just to see if I messed anything up. And you talk about like a very stressful way to do things. You know, they're like, all right, well, everything looks good. Uh, and we can see this is a shaving waiver and we can see it in the system, but we need an MFR from the shaving waiver. And I'm like, what? And this, this is like AFPC HQ. And I was like, what? And so of course that happens, send it back. And they're like, Oh, well during this process, your security clearance was valid, but now it's lapsed. And I'm like, well, yeah, because it's been like three months. Like it was good when we started it. So then I needed to rehack the security clearance, which you guys know is just fascinating coming up with all the places <laughs> you've lived since you were born for 10 yeah. years yeah. yeah yeah does your mother's womb have an address can you put it down? <laughs> is there anybody in there that knew you so, <laughs> well my twin actually yeah so haha uh but the the paperwork was so heinous it almost made me like <laughs> just stay in texas which is maybe what they wanted uh but i, I followed through with that finally got down to coco beach and this has been the best decision of my life. I just like, want to hit I that. Love it. I just want to hit that one real quick. So you went from active duty over to reserve. A lot of the guys that, uh, all the questions that I get are, is it possible to go over and why would you want to go do that? You know, other people are chasing like, uh, some kind of degree or if they're staying at home with family for some kind of reason. Um, what do you think is the biggest reason why you wanted to go? And, um, what do you think is the biggest difference between being active and being reserve? No. Uh, so my main motivators personally and professionally were family, like, you know, uh, you know, going to be 
starting a, a family uh, with my girlfriend and, you know, escalating, you know, that relationship and stuff. And uh, also my, my uh, college degree uh, operationally uh, more on the, so that's personal side. It's pretty much just family, family and self education and bettering myself for life after the military uh, professionally as a team leader and as a technical sergeant, you know, you put on master and active duty unit and you could still do the job or you could be writing a desk, you know, but on the reserve and guard side, like there's still like senior master sergeants out there getting it like on the, on the ground, like your, your operational life is extended start to reserve men, reservist. Uh, and so I still feel like I got a lot of fight left in me and I still want to do awesome stuff, you know, hood rat show with my friends. And so like that's, that's, yes, of course. Of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. Uh, hashtag. Uh, and so that that's professionally why I did it. Uh, and on the reserve side, going f- talking to the people that aren't in the military yet, what's really cool is that all these guard and reserve bases have uh, like hiring windows that they'll bring you guys. Coupling that with my ANS experience, I can also help better prepare people that Cocoa Beach wants to hire to be like, oh yeah, this is what you need to focus on, this is what you need to do, or hey, maybe this isn't the guy, or maybe you're not ready in this aspect. And I mean, now I just can be employed so much more and get back to that coaching, training, mentoring uh, that I that I want to do so much. And actually so, do the mentoring this time. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the, the reason the reason why I went is personally, family, actually staying in the fight. Nice. And exploring more of what it is to be a pararescue man and doing NASA recovery missions and Rams jumps to the open water. And of course, going back to Afghanistan or Africa or wherever. So can, can we get a guard or reservist that's unhappy in the guard or reserve next time? Cause I'm really yeah. getting tired of all these guys telling yeah. all these great stories. They don't um, exist, so I'm, I'm sick of it. A little more. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a better shot of finding Bigfoot up here in the Pacific Northwest than we do somebody that's <laughs> disgruntled in guard or reserves. Yeah. I am so happy. <laughs> All right, let's bring it to our last customary question. We always ask dudes that have been, you know, through Indoc, through a bunch of stuff like you have. Um, what would you say if for those guys and girls that are out there training, training their butts off, going to the pool and all that, now that they're open, um, what would you say that they need to keep in mind and what is your best tool, best piece of advice for getting through the pipeline and then being successful at not only as a PJ, but whatever else, you know, CCT in life? What is your piece of advice to them? Mm. Well, in order to be in the pipeline, you got to make it through ANS. My single piece of advice that, that I've known to come to ANS is I think you need to be able to ruck 15 miles with a 50 pound pack at a 15 minute per mile pace. If you can do that, then you'll be ready because it's not the timed rucks that get you. It's the ruck to the ruck that gets you. And then guess what? You do, you do a ruck to the timed ruck. And then you're tired after that. And then you're going to ruck back from the ruck you just did. And rucking (laughs) is murdering people these days. Like people that are, they can swim the cups, like their feet and their knees are just given out. They're not used to, to, and even though prep tries to prepare them, I think they're coddled a little bit too much. But for some reason, when you get to ANS and you're in these field settings and your bottoms, like the bottoms of your feet, like are going to get trench footy. Like you need to be rucking. And then, uh, That'll get you through ANS. If you can get to the end of ANS, statistically speaking, you got a 50 50 shot of making it. Either you're a select or non select, but you have to be able to ruck in today's game. There's not as much of a premium on the running and the swimming as there was when we went through our models that we did. Like, if you can crush rucks, that you just significantly upped your stock. So, once again, I recommend a 15 mile ruck with at least a 50 pound pack at a 15 minute per mile pace. If you can do that and show up at ANS, you're I think you're gonna do pretty good. So as long as you're able to do that, you're not recommending that they do it once a week kind of thing. It's just no, no, as no. as a culmination or a capstone, be able to do this, a fifteen miler yeah. with fifty pounds. Yeah, yeah. If you, as soon as soon as you check that box, you don't you do not need to do it every day, but be able to check it at least once and then ANS is just a month of full send fun so, times yeah uh and then as far as motivation in the pipeline i feel like social media has disserviced a lot of people you the 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 new listeners to the the future cones you need to make sure that this is what you want to do want to it, 
This is just my view. Like if you want to kick indoors and shoot people in the face, go join the army or the Navy, because what an air force special operator is, is truly like the jack of all trades, whether you're a controller an SR or PJ, like, yes, you're going to be kicking indoors and, you know, shooting people in the face until something happens. The first people off the triggers and onto the radios or the medicine are the air force guys. And I say that, this with a grain of 100% true, but you're going to be just as tired as the army guys that you just rocked in with. You're going to be just as, you know, blown up and confused as the army guys you just got blown up with, but it's your job as the controller, the PJ to continue pushing forward to accurately drop those bombs, to accurately give those drugs. Like you're, you're, I believe that only air force special operations jobs truly begin once the shit has hit the fan, generally steel just keeps pulling the trigger, which is awesome. And you need that to be happening, but it's the air force guys that not only you need to do all this stuff, but then you also need to facilitate a great thing. Make sure you know what you're getting into because there's so much more to air force spec ops than just shooting a fucking gun. Like you need to be smart. You need to be intelligent, charismatic. You will, even if you're the best PJ or combat controller in the world, you will never do your job if the team doesn't like you. Like you, 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 and as long as there's a, a, the mission, the men and great book on military leadership, there's also how to win friends and influence people. Like you need to, you need to be a people person because you're going to show up to these teams as a random air force guy. And then you're going to need to become their friend in order to do your job. Yep. And so, as soon as you but, show up, they automatically don't trust you or until you're able to prove that you are, you know, worthy. Then yeah. You're just, you're just another dude that they have to worry about. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I know that was compressing that all in. If you want to be a PJ, make sure you know what PJs do stateside operationally, everything like that. Uh, a lot of people discredit TAC P's, but if you just want to drop bombs, TAC P is a great job because that's all TAC P's do. Combat controllers have the whole like other side of the world mission. You know, where you're also dropping bombs, you're also setting up airfields, you're also running planes. And a lot of people are just like, well, I don't want to do any of that. It's like, well, you should have been attacked even. Like, no, no, up for it. So be able to ruck, research what you want to do, get off Instagram and actually crack a book uh, <laughs> and uh, reach, reach out to friends. So that's my advice. Yeah, I think those are all super valid. And a lot of things that I've told people that reach out to me um through messaging on instagram which is one of the good ways to do use instagram don't just read like all the bi <laughs> the bios that are there like all the cool action stories or whatever but reach out to us that's why we're here to answer questions for you guys and we'll be real with you just like gavin is right now we'll tell you exactly if you don't if you want to go shoot people and you want to that is all you want to go do is shoot cool guns and do that kind of stuff then go do the navy seal job go do the green beret job ranger whatever um but this job in the Air Force, just like Gavin was talking about, exploring um, all the different aspects that PJs have to offer because it's jack of all trades. You know, you can do the military side of the rescue or you can do the civilian side and you can jump on. There's guys that jump onto cruise ships or jump onto whatever kind of Rams mission, which is a boat that you throw out of an aircraft and you inflate it, drive up to a boat and save a dude. Um, so there's plenty of different options that you can explore in PJs. So that's one of the things that all of us love about our jobs is being able to do something different every single day and continue to challenge ourselves. So just like Gavin was saying, um, I'm just going to wrap it up real quick and we'll go to your last thoughts here and open it up for you guys, uh, final questions. Um, so Gavin, like you said, you've done a crap ton from Vegas deploying, uh, multiple times to combat zones from, pretty much growing up from uh, being a pup up to team leader, like you said, and technical rescue specialist in charge of a bunch of dudes um, all in Vegas and then went over to the NS side and were able to take that experience and transfer it over into what you're doing over there in Patrick, which is, I think, invaluable because um, just being in that position to help mentor guys really makes you get you some introspection into what you believe and what you really value in life. So it seems like you're already doing that, which is why we have you here. I know you briefly mentioned being blown up. We'll save that for a different time. Um, and we'll share, go into that kind of story. We want to have a story time podcast, maybe like as an extra or something like that. You guys yeah. let us know if you want us to, uh, you guys listeners out there, if you want to, uh, 
have us uh, open up for story time. We'll bring different dudes on to tell their kind of stories. So, um, yeah. All overall, though, this guy Gavin, thank you for coming on. Your total stud um, representation of what a PJ should be, and like you said, super charismatic. I remember he is always the dude in the bar telling stories and just always captures everyone's attention whenever he's up there speaking about whatever's going on. So, again. Um, super awesome PJ and thank you again for coming on open it to you guys yeah, any final questions thoughts remarks anything no I'm good man Gavin are you uh, are you cool with having people hit you up on your IG if you want if you if you want to have them follow you or whatever throw your IG handle out there oh it's uh wait what is it it's, DJ Fish Sticks yeah, DJ Fish Sticks part of that story questions. part of that story time is going to be me telling the DJ Fish Sticks story the best story of all time <laughs> <laughs> How the, when the legend was born. DJ Fish <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's it's DJ Fish Sticks. Hit me up. I'm terrible at texting and responding, but uh, I'll get to it eventually. So. <laughs> All right, Trent. Air anything? No, I'm or, good. Thanks for coming on, Gavin. Appreciate your time, bud. All right, yeah, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks again for you guys for listening and you guys can always hit us up any, anytime. We're here for you. If you have any questions or you want to see anything on the podcast, make sure you hit us up. We, I'm getting set up right now to open up the shop again so you guys can order up those Gray Man shirts and we still have the sticker packs and everything. Shop's going to be open real soon. So make sure you go ahead and check that out. And if you guys need anything at any point in time, make sure you hit us up. Follow us. Um, make sure you leave us a comment, five-star review over on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. And thank you again for your support. You guys go out there, earn each breath. Later. Later. Train hard. Later.